Hi everybody, my name is Nate. I'm a PT at the Mattapan Clinic. And for this in-service, I wanna talk about PRI and the expansion compression model, and then talk about some considerations for whiplash. So PRI stands for the Postural Restoration Institute. It's a continuing education institute started by a PT in the late 90s. And then expansion compression model is sort of a, a biomechanical model that was created by a PT who took a lot of PRI courses and then took the concepts and applied them to strength and conditioning. Um, so for myself, I've done quite a few continuing education classes. I've done five different classes through the PRI um, Institute and then a couple of other courses that go into the expansion and compression model as well. So expansion and compression is just a way of describing two different strategies of creating movement. So in the human body, you can say that everything, every movement is either a type of compression or a type of an expansion or a combination between the two. So compression would be squeezing a muscle, it would be exhaling, it would be putting force downwards into the ground. And some generalized examples would be like powerlifting, sprinting, or picking something up off the ground. And then expansion would just be the exact opposite of that. So that's relaxing a muscle, that's inhaling, and that's doing something where you're receiving force up from the ground. So that could be jumping, distance running, or squatting down into it like a deep squat. Asymmetry is a concept that is kind of foundational to the PRI or postural restoration um, treatment approach. And they talk a lot about how the human body is naturally asymmetrical and how that's not a bad thing, that's just that our physical structure, like our hardware, as well as our neurology or our software, it's just naturally biases one side of the body to have certain roles and the other side to have complementary roles. Um, and so along those lines, the right side tends to be more of a compressive biased side where we're actually heavier on the right side of our body due to the liver being on that side. The diaphragm on that side is much stronger and larger and it sits in more of an exhaled domed position and even when you look at the nostrils, breathing through your right nostril pairs with sympathetic nervous system activity, whereas the left side is a little bit more the opposite. It's a little bit more expansive. We tend to have more abdominal volume sit on that side. The, the, the diaphragm is a little bit weaker and sits in more of an inhaled position where it's more flattened out. And then breathing through your left nostril actually activates more parasympathetic rest and digest type of tone. And this, again, is not a bad thing. It's not that we want everybody to be symmetrical. This actually creates ingrained pressure gradients in the body, creates sort of a potential energy situation where we can be moving from one side to the other and back and forth. And the goal is for people to be able to have that movement variability where they can access both sides of their body equally and shift equally back and forth between them. I want to talk briefly about the concept of posture as well. Um, I think posture in general tends to be misunderstood. And the way I think of posture is not so much a static position because I don't think there's any ideal static position that's good for your body to just sit in for a long period of time. Um, I think more so about postural control and which I would define that as your ability to maintain um, body system integrity through a variety of body positions and in the face of a variety of stressors to your body, so not always collapsing into the same body postural um, strategy for handling a load. Um, and then I think that has to do a lot more with your ability to manage pressures inside your body as well as external pressures put on your body, as opposed to the more traditional model of like levers and pulleys and lining up with a plumb line. Um, I think it's helpful for posture to think more about a canister and not so much like a rigid, hard aluminum can, but almost like a deformable, deformable, more of a soft can. And if you look for somebody's posture and you think of them, their trunk being like a canister and you look for areas that are dented, those tend to be the areas that they're having more compression, compression happening in their body. 
So somebody in more of like a slouched posture, you could call that like a compression on the front of their body. Or somebody with an overly up tall and arched posture might have more compression on the back of their body. To think through how this all applies to whiplash, I want to start first by just talking about the mechanism of injury. So whiplash is an aggressive stretch to the body where you're going to have micro strains and tearing to all of the tissues involved to some degree. The muscles, the fascia, ligaments, blood vessels, nerves, discs, everything gets kind of aggravated by that. And so your body's natural response is to have inflammation come in, more sympathetic body tone, and more kind of protective, compressive strategies around that because they're not feeling very safe to move. They're going to be hesitant to move. They're going to, their body's going to want to reduce movement variability in order to keep things feeling braced and safe. And that's helpful, you know, the first day or two after an accident or a whiplash. But our job is to teach them to kind of work their way out of that to where it doesn't become a chronic thing where they're always fearful and tightened up and avoidant of movement. So I want to talk about some high-risk interventions or things that are more likely to be potentially aggravating to the areas that are injured after a whiplash injury, especially early on in the treatment. And the first thing that comes to mind is a prolonged stretch. Because if whiplash is already a stretch mechanism of injury, then that tissue is going to be aggravated if you're just putting it at a very lengthened position and holding that for a long period of time. I think also activating those muscles only into a concentric and tightened position. So doing a lot of repeated extensions, but not balancing that out with flexion can be almost reinforcing what those muscles are already doing if they're already trying to tighten up back there. Same thing with just generally sympathetic driving activities. So that's things that resemble more like strength or power training, where you're trying to create a lot of bracing for stability, like even like a plank, a pal-off press, a bridge where they're holding up for a long period of time. Um, even with their eyes, if their eyes are looking at the ground or they're overly tucking their chin with every movement. Those sort of things are reinforcing what, on an internal level, their body might already be doing of trying to hold very still and protective. Um, and in general, low movement variability or with your exercise selection, if they're always in the same sort of body posture and they're not getting much rotation or alternation in their body, maybe like with um, exercises where they're doing the same thing with both arms or with both legs at the same time, those sort of things are more likely to kind of just reinforce the movement strategy that they're already using. And so some things that I would suggest as more of a low risk starting point for movement for these people, I would say in general, slow, continuous, um, gentle movement. So just active range of motion through a comfortable range, things that generally are more on the parasympathetic end of the spectrum, like even slow, quiet, diaphragmatic breathing, um, giving a lot of reference points for stability where people aren't feeling like off balance or like they're going to fall. And even factors like being encouraging, being positive and empathetic could be really important for these people if they're already feeling just stressed out and overwhelmed. Um, I think in general high movement variability is more the way to go early on where you're doing alternating unilateral, unilateral exercise, um, separation of lower and upper body movement, things where you're cueing them to look forward with their eyes as opposed to looking at the ground and going through full ranges between flexion and, exten and extension. And in general, I would describe these as activities that are more so inspired by a pattern of the gait cycle where your body naturally rotates from the upper body opposite to the lower and the right side of your body is doing the opposite thing of the left side. Those sort of things tend to be more calming and relaxing to the system as opposed to things where you're bracing and creating excessive stability. So I want to cue Eric through a few specific exercises that I might start with somebody after they've had a whiplash injury, as well as then go through showing some rapid fire of some more um, functional activities, strength training type introductory movements that I would go through. And then at the end, I'll summarize some of these key points. Okay, so for this exercise, you're just going to relax in the chair and you're going to have your arms resting across the top of your knees with your elbows straight. And you're gonna slide your right arm forward 
and then you're going to slide your left arm forward as the right arm draws back. And we're just going to move back and forth like that, alternating arms. And the goal is to feel some rotation between the mid-back area. Yeah. You can also coordinate this with breathing. So you could cue them to breathe in each time the right arm goes forward, breathe out with the left arm. And then after they do maybe 10 on each side, then switch it and, and breathe with the opposite arm. So the next thing is going to be just a, a starting point for doing some diaphragmatic breathing. So say, Eric, if you were somebody with more of a slouched posture to begin with, then I would want to do things to breathe some air into the front of your rib cage. And so I would have you just rest with your forearms on your knees like this. And then with your eyes, look about six feet in front of you and try to, as you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, Try to feel that air stretching into the front of your ribs or kind of into your chest area. And just do, you could do five breaths in a row for one set, take a little break, and then repeat for three or four sets. Let's say if you are somebody with more of like an upright arched back position, where you're sitting up tall or you're feeling really tight in the mid back, then I would give you like a pillow or an Airx pad on your lap and have you turn your palms facing toward you. Put a light band around your wrists and then you're just going to rest on your elbows with your palms facing toward you and breathe from there. With the band you don't have to pull hard at all, it's just creating a little bit of activation and you'll feel more air coming into the back between the shoulder blades. And you could do the same thing, um, sets of five breaths at a time. That's a good one. I definitely feel it too in the shoulders. Yeah, that's a favorite of mine. Okay, so for this, we're going to have you stand with staggered stance. So you're going to have your opposite foot forward to the one that's pulling. You're going to, with your left arm, you're going to be rowing back and at the same time reach forward with your right arm, almost like you're drawing a bow and arrow. And then you just let it come back forward and we'll keep going back and forth like that. So you could do like 10 in a row on that side, just cueing for a relaxed, uh, subtle bend in the knees, relaxed back position. And then after you do that side, then switch it and uh, switch the feet as well. And you could do you know, a couple sets of 10 on each side. This can also be a good one to do seated sometimes for people too. And for this one, you're gonna want either a chair that's nice and stable propped against the table, or you could use like a low mat. And you're gonna have them come down to where their hands are on the edge of the chair. And then you're gonna step your feet back a little bit further than that but you want to make sure your heels are down, so maybe come one baby step forward, one more with each foot, right there. And you should feel a stretch at the back of your legs. Yeah. And then we're doing a rock back, so you can push through your hands so that your back pockets stretch back into the air, and then come out of it. Maybe do a few like that. That can be a good starting point. And then we're gonna add some reaches with it, so each time you rock back, your hand is gonna reach and touch your opposite shin, or your opposite toe if you can reach it and then you come out of it each time. So you rock back, reach across and touch, and then come out of it, and then go to the opposite side. So you're going back and forth where it's not a constant stretch. This can be really helpful for lower back tightness, um, especially like tightness at the, the glutes area. It can also be helpful even for like a shoulder progression where you're getting them to be able to reach and press overhead in a more stable closed chain position.
So just to summarize some of these points, um, the natural reaction to a whiplash injury is going to be excessive compression, excessive muscular bracing in the area of the injury. And so with that in mind, some interventions that might be more high risk to aggravate would be things that resemble powerlifting and have a lot of excessive bracing early on, um, things that are good for maximal force production and stability, but not so much for reducing whiplash associated symptoms. Um, some things that I would recommend for interventions are more so resemblant of gait pattern type movement. And the focus would be more preferably on reducing compensatory compression in the area of the spine, as well as improving just their general confidence and ease of movement. And as you progress that over time, I would recommend focusing more on unilateral or alternating movements with your lifts and get them to kind of start putting some weight or some, some skill with that before progressing to bilateral and symmetrical movements with lifting.